Will Sony ever make a 77 inch Bravia 8 Mark II? What's with AMOLED and why isn't it talked about in TV circles? Why isn't OLED burn-in on phones talked about as much? And are we finally getting more sports in HDR? All that and more coming up on Just Ask Caleb. Welcome back to Just Ask Caleb, everyone. I'm Caleb Dennison, and we've got some great questions and I hope great answers for you today. Just remember, if you have a question you want to see answered on the show, email askcaleb at calebrady.com and we'll see if your question gets picked. Now, if you aren't a member of this channel, consider becoming one. For just $1.99, your question will float to the top for consideration. Just put nitpicker in the subject line. All right, let's do it. And we'll start with one from Chirantan to Luckdar. That guy's just coming up with banger questions. That's the first time ever I've selected a question from the same person two weeks in a row. Anyway, they're great questions. What can I say? He says, hey, Caleb, I've always wondered why AMOLED screens on phones aren't considered amazing or groundbreaking, but OLED screens on TVs and other large displays are considered amazing. How did OLED screens become the norm for phones, but not for larger displays? Why is, say, mini LED not used in phones? And if it is, why is it so unheard of? If OLED technology is so expensive to manufacture, how did it become normal for phones to have OLED screens? And why aren't OLED phones crazy expensive compared to non-OLED phones like OLED TVs are crazy expensive compared to non-OLED TVs? He's not done. What does AMOLED stand for? And how is it different from other types of OLED such as WOLED and QD OLED? Why isn't AMOLED used on TVs and monitors? And I've almost never seen anyone talking about burn-in on phones. Isn't AMOLED an OLED technology then why does no one talk about burn-in on AMOLED phones? And why are there no OLED care features on phones? And if there are, why aren't they advertised? And why don't people specifically look for OLED care and burn-in and prevention on phones? I hope you give us viewers a long explanation for all of my questions. Yes, Sharantan, I'm not sure I could do it any other way at this point. Wow. So let's just run this down, not necessarily in the order that you sent that marathon email, my friend. I do love it. I did pick your question, didn't I? What does AMOLED stand for? Active Matrix Organic Light Emitting Diode. So Active Matrix OLED. What is Super AMOLED? That's where the touch sensitive layer is integrated into the screen itself. And it isn't a layer that's just put on top. Why isn't AMOLED used in TVs and monitors? Well, it is actually all OLED TV screens are AMOLED in that they all use an active matrix. It's just that OLED TVs were only ever made by one manufacturer for a long time and LG Display, the manufacturer, didn't see the need to use that terminology, probably since its main competitor, Samsung, was using it like it was a marketing term. The marketing term just never made it to TVs because, well, it's redundant, but also being used by LG's sworn enemy in commerce. Anyway, next, how did OLED screens become the norm for phones, but not for larger displays? Well, for the same reason, I'm gonna give you for the next question, which is why is, say, mini LED not used in phones? Well, that's because LCD screens require a backlight and backlight systems, even mini LEDs, take up a lot of space. And phones don't just need to be thin to look and feel awesome. They need to be thin as a practical matter. It's hard to sell a thick phone, uh, save perhaps to the tough and rugged audience. Now, why doesn't anyone talk about burn-in on AMOLED phones and why are there no OLED care features on phones? Well, there are OLED care features on OLED phones. They just aren't marketed much because phone makers don't really need to assure their customers that their phone isn't likely to get burn-in. It's just assumed that the phone isn't gonna get burn-in and the reason they aren't likely to get burn-in, and to be clear, some folks will get burn-in on their phones. There just aren't very many of them. The reason is because the viewing behavior that causes burn-in on TVs is much less prevalent on a phone. Very few people leave their phone playing CNN or Fox News for five plus hours a day battery's probably gonna run out before that happens anyway. They don't play the same video games with the same head-up displays for four plus hours a day non-stop. The automatic brightness feature rarely gets turned off on phones from what I've been told. And I could go on, but the point is the viewing behavior required to cause burn-in 
on an OLED is very rare to see on a phone. Also, most folks don't keep their phones nearly as long as their TV. So the long-term burn-in risk is also minimized there. I think I got them all, but if not, let me know. Oh, you know what? There was one more, but I'm gonna make it part of the next question. So Sharantan also asked, why aren't OLED phones crazy expensive compared to non-OLED phones? Like OLED TVs are crazy expensive compared to non-OLED TVs. And another viewer, okay, like more like 200 other viewers asked, are we ever getting a 77 inch Sony Bravia 8 Mark II? Now, what could those two questions possibly have to do with each other? Well, possibly nothing, but I have a suspicion nobody will confirm. Uh, I just can't let go of it. And actually, you know what? That sounds like a conspiracy. So let's call it a theory. Right, a theory. Here's the deal. OLED TV devices are cut out of a large sheet of something called mother glass. That mother glass will get masked off and then through a process called photolithography, the OLED pixels will be printed on this mother glass. That's how you can have different pixel densities and different pixel per inch measurements from a single piece of mother glass. Now, purely for the sake of illustration, let's say you can either make 24 phones or 12 phones and two monitors and one 55 inch TV, or you can make just two 65 inch TVs or just one 77 inch TV. Now, I actually think it's more like 177 inch TV and a handful of phones. The purpose is you got one big piece of glass, you can only cut it so many different ways. And if you make a 77 inch TV out of that big old piece of glass, you're not getting much more out of that piece of glass. Now, think about the money you could make by selling 24 phones. Let's say uh, $24,000, the phones cost a thousand bucks, 24,000 bucks out of 24 phones. You can do 12 phones and a 55 inch TV for 13,300. You can do two 65 inch TVs for about 3,200, getting pretty low. And you can do one 77 inch TV for about 2,500 bucks. That's a Delta of about $21,500 between doing 24 phones or doing one 77 inch TV. That 77 inch TV represents a pretty big loss in potential profit. Now, all that math tells us a few things. It's way cheaper to make OLED phone screens, thus the phones aren't outrageously expensive. It's marginally more expensive to make OLED monitors, which does absolutely nothing to explain why OLED computer monitors are outrageously expensive, um, as much as TVs sometimes when there isn't even processing in them, maybe just a fancy case and some RGB, why are they so expensive? Also, why OLED TVs are indeed expensive. Also, also, it tells us that the 77 inch OLED panel is among the most expensive OLED panels you can make. It also explains why 83 inch OLED panels are incredibly expensive and anything larger than that is going to be like as expensive as a car. Now, if any of you are scrutinizing the actual numbers and math in my explanation, then just stop it right now. Get your hands away from the keyboard. As I said, I was just illustrating the concept of ratios here. Anyway, given that 77 inch QD OLED panels are precious, I've long suspected that maybe, maybe Samsung Display might wanna keep most of them for Samsung Electronics or that they may be so expensive that Sony doesn't wanna bother buying them. But Sony denies this is the case. And well, I'm inclined to believe them because my source has always been a straight shooter. He's also a Canadian. And as we all know, Canadians are incapable of lying due to a certain genetic marker. The same one, by the way, responsible for their obsession with putting gravy and cheese on French fries. But I digress. Sony says that the reason we don't see a 77 inch Bravia 8 Mark II is that the A95L is killing it at 77 inches. And in addition to having, and if it ain't broke, don't fix it attitude, Sony says the professional world is heavily invested in the 77 inch A95L and doesn't want to have to go and replace a bunch of them. If one dies, they can just buy a new A95L. Everything matches up perfectly. That way, the stuff that people are looking at in Hollywood is the same as the stuff that the executives are looking at in New York because they have the same displays. Very important to those 
admittedly very rich Hollywood type people. Anyway, there are some obvious follow-up questions to the answer Sony gave me, and I did ask them, but I don't have anything more to share with you. I will say never give up hope, but also do not hold off on buying something on that hope. Or just get the 77 inch A95L. It is a certified banger and an instant classic. Hey, before I go on, I just wanted to let you know that as I'm recording this, October 24, which is about a week before you'll watch it, I'm about to head off to Seoul, Korea for a little pre-CES excitement. When I get back, I'm on the ground for like a day before taking a trip down to Atlanta. That means I won't be shooting for about 12 days. Fortunately, Zeke and I have been grinding to fill up our video vault with content that we can run during my time away. Unfortunately, that means I won't get to record the next big TV review for a bit. But back to fortunately, we have the QM8K versus U8QG coming to you. Don't want to miss it. That along with a bunch of super fun content, I think that you'll enjoy. In the meantime, if you aren't already subscribed to my personal channel, Caleb Loves Tech, consider subscribing there as well because I'm gonna be putting out vlogs and updates while I travel, in case you feel like following along. Anyway, I wanted to say thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Zeke thanks you too for helping make this new channel such a smashing success so far. And we aren't gonna stop. These trips I'm making are part of some killer new content we're gonna bring you in the days leading up to CES and beyond. We have some seriously fun stuff in store and I cannot wait to show you. Okay, update over. Let's get to the next question, which comes from Webb who says, hi Caleb, I'm watching opening night of the NBA on Peacock today and I noticed it's in HDR. Are all HDR contents automatically 4K? I read somewhere that sports are usually just 1080p. Webb, that is amazing. I had no idea and I kind of wish I had caught it. So first, can we just celebrate that something other than the Super Bowl or the Olympics is going out in HDR? That's awesome. That shows me that NBC, and I also happen to know Fox Sports, a major force in pushing HDR sports, NBC is also making headway. That's awesome. And yes, it may often be in 1080p. It could be in 4K, but the reason why it's often in 1080p Man, I wish I could show you my Super Bowl footage, but I learned this from Fox Sports and uh, one particular gentleman who is contracting for all the networks to get HDR sports out there. All of the broadcast infrastructure is built around 1080p. If they were to do all cameras in 4K, not only would they have to quadruple their cabling, they'd have to cut their camera count down to 25% of what they're using now. So if they had 25 cameras deployed in the stadium, they'd have to cut down to like four or five cameras. They just aren't built for native 4K, these mobile broadcast units. Maybe one day they will be, but we are talking about billions upon billions of dollars of gear and cabling already installed in mobile cities that go from stadium to stadium and field to field to capture live sports and broadcast it to us. And replacing all that stuff isn't gonna happen soon and it really ain't gonna be cheap. When you do get 4K sports, it is almost always professionally upscaled from 1080p at the broadcast center. The question is whether NBC did 1080p delivery in HDR or upscaled it uh, to 4K. Sounds like they went with 1080p delivery, which I think is fine when you get 1080p in HDR. Uh, the HDR right there makes more of a difference than resolution at all but the hugest screen sizes anyway. But man, I really appreciate you raising the question so that we could talk about it. Folks, that is it for this week's episode of Just Ask Caleb. Don't forget to email me at askcaleb at calebrated.com. Like, comment, subscribe, and hype this video if you don't mind helping me out. I'll see you on the next one, and until then, take care. Am I ever going to make this video, or am I going to peak the meter every time we start?